Let's have silent meditation. And please meditate with me on the words from a Cherokee prayer. O oh, great spirit, grant that I may never find fault with my neighbor until I have walked the trail of life in his moccasins. Thank you. Yesterday, when I was reviewing what I wanted to talk about this morning, um, thanks to Terry, I should acknowledge Terry's input into this service, um, I began to think, oh my gosh, I come to church for a spiritual experience. And then I thought, well, what do I really mean by spiritual? And is this service going to be a spiritual experience for you? So I was sort of trying to figure out what do I mean by spiritual and then try to put it into a context about the service today so you can see, you will see that my intent was to make this spiritual. So when I think about spiritual in my limited way, and I'm going to stumble over some of these words because it's not particularly prepared, um, I think at this stage of my life or growth, that spiritual means being open um, to the beauty and love and wonder around me. And being open means I have to sort of slowly shed my, peel, my onion peels, my onion skins, and get rid of like my ego here, my ego there, my expectations, my assumptions, all the things that I think I need to operate in the world, and come back to what's really real, true, and right. So today's Mother's Day, and this service is about mothers, and I think, I know, being a mother um, has been spiritual for me in the sense that being a parent, uh, being a caregiver, means that you keep dropping away all the assumptions that you make about what you want your children to be, a reflection of you, of course, the good person you are. So. Um, this is spiritual in the sense we're talking about being a mother, being a caregiver, and the goodness that comes from that act or those acts over the years, the goodness that's inside all of us when we strip away some of the onion skins around us. Um, we're here in church today. I don't know about you, but being in church for me is a spiritual experience because if I weren't here, and I'm not here every Sunday, but when I'm not here, I don't get that call that I need, some of us need, to, um, and, and to be reminded of the better person we can be, not the person I am during the week, which my husband will attest to, um, but the better person that I can be. So this is like a, an infusion, a reminder that there's a world out there uh, that my narrow vision doesn't see, a world of beauty, a world of need, um, of our fellow human beings. And so being here today by itself, I think, is spiritual, can be a spiritual experience. And lastly, our service is about, I will be talking about low-income families. And um, I'm speaking for myself, but I know many of you have had the same experience. Uh, whether it's a low-income person or family or whether it's an, a person, an older person who has a need or an ill person or whatever, being with people who, um, I don't want to say have less than you do, because they may have more in some ways, but have less uh, abilities, financial and health-wise, uh, can bring us back, I think, to what's important in life, what's important in our life. And again, it's sort of an, it requires us to sort of be open to others and to the world and it also means in that openness, stripping away some of the things that we think are important to maintain our, our world as we want it in our lives. So if you're not convinced this is a spiritual service today, I've done my best. <laughs> as we have um, in past years, we're celebrating Mother's Day, but we're using a broad definition of mothers. 
uh, we celebrate all those, not just mothers, but it's easy to use that term rather than saying, we celebrate all those who care for and nurture our children. And that can include fathers, mothers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and friends, as well as foster parents. We have wonderful foster parents out in the community doing a nurturing and caring job for, for our children. As we sit in this lovely space, surrounded by what I see, happy and healthy faces, our image of mother will probably look a lot like us, happy, healthy, well-fed. All is well, or is it? Well, estimates indicate that all is well for about 60% of all, adult, uh, all adults who are of child-rearing age. The remainder, 40%, not all is well for them because, as one of our children said, they're poor. They are limited in terms of their income or their resources. Most then aren't able to adequately care for their children, though most are in the mothering role that we all agree and research really confirms is one of the most important factors of influencing the well-being of our children and the future of our children. This morning, I want you to experience, to the limited extent you can in about 12 or 15 minutes, the feelings too many mothering adults in the US face every day. The experience of making choices related to basic needs of their much loved children with the limited income and resources they have. After this experiential activity, we'll have a few minutes for conversation. So, what is the experiential activity? I want you to turn to uh, a couple items in your bulletin. One is this sheet. And this comes, I should give credit, this comes through Terry from the United Way. United Ways are doing a lot to try to uh, involve the public in the needs of low-income families. You'll, you'll have this sheet, and hopefully all of you have 15 stickers uh, a row of 10, and then another row of five more. You need 15 stickers for your experience this morning because this represents income. So if you don't have 15, you're really poor. Does everyone have 15? Uh, okay, those that don't, please quickly put your hands up and our wonderful usher, ushers will distribute them. Anyone else? Okay, Janine over here. Put. Okay. Uh. Anyone else? Excuse me? Oh, Carol? Carol, I'll give you these five. Oh. I've already. Oh, oh you need. You need ten. No, I got two. Okay, okay. Okay. I think we're good then. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Okay, now, now listen carefully, folks. Um, this, is, this is pretty simple, but if you don't hear me, um, you'll be lost. Again, the stickers, the 15 stickers you have represents your monthly income. Uh, other groups, when they've done it, have had candies. We decided not to give you candies. We decided to give you stickers. So when you see candies across the top here, just... That's, that means stickers. Um, and <clears throat> the sheet you have lists eight categories down the left side. And these are the eight categories of basic needs. Housing, it starts with housing and it goes down through shopping and spending money. Across the top, you'll see a level A, B, and C. Level A means that in terms of housing, <clears throat> housing for example, you may choose, when I give you instructions, further instructions, you may choose to spend your um, 15 stickers, one of the 15 stickers on very basic housing, a studio apartment with one bedroom. Or you may choose to spend three of your 15 stickers on a house with two bedrooms and one and a half baths. If you use three of your 15 then, you'll have less stickers for healthcare, food, transportation, etc. 
Does that make sense so far? Okay. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to read you a very brief scenario of which you are a part of a four-person family. I'm going to read you the scenario, and then I'm going to ask you, based on what you've heard me say, to spend your 15 stickers among these eight categories. And I'll give you just a couple minutes. I did this with Ken yesterday just to practice, and he overthought it, believe it or not. So <laughs> he had all these questions. So don't overthink. This, this is just to give you a, a sense of what it's like to be a low-income family. Um, and I'll give you just a couple minutes for the scenario. Um, OK. Um, let's see, scenario one. Oh, OK. You are married with two children, a son 14 and a daughter 9. Your spouse works full time, and you work two part-time jobs. You both make minimum wage, which is $7.25 an hour. Given that information, knowing you need to have us to put stickers in all eight categories and you only have 15, you shouldn't overthink, and I'll give you a couple minutes, um, go ahead and put your stickers in the categories and for the uh, level of support you want in each category. I'll give you just another, what, 30 seconds to finish up? Or a minute to finish up? Okay. Does anyone need more time? A couple more? OK. okay. We, we could figure out who were the overthinkers here. <laughs> Okay, 30 more seconds, folks.
Well, I didn't see anybody scratching their head or pulling their hair out. Does that mean it was relatively easy? No. Um, what was it? Let, let's hear from one or two folks. What was your experience, Susan Clay? Hard to stretch. Yeah, that image is stretching the dollar. Yes, Debbie. Yes, that's frustrating. That's hard. Do whatever is the least painful, and that can vary from family to family. Obviously, anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry, Linda. I have these triple file focals on. Um, Carrie said, we've got to have insurance, so we spent three stickers on each one. Harry so, said, yeah. ins insurance is worth three stickers. <laughs> and some it's people... It's not 2014 yet. It's not 2014 yet. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll still have to have some. One more. Uh, yes. You gave up your computer? Yes, life was not too Right. Well, you know, we're not finished because we all know that people's circumstances can be static at one point in time, but circumstances can change for families, obviously, and they do change. Sometimes they get better and sometimes they get worse. In our case, they're getting a little bit worse, but that is, that is reality for many families. Um, so I'm going to give you a new scenario, and I'm going to ask you to do the same exercise. Uh, the same family, but now the nine-year-old daughter has an infected tooth and has to see the dentist. Uh, and dental care is not covered by your employer's health insurance, <laughs> if you have it. Sorry, Harry. <laughs> In order for her to see the dentist, you must give up two of your stickers, which means reallocating the rest of your stickers. Now you have 13 stickers, folks. So look back at your sheet again, please, remembering you have to have a sticker in every category, at least one, and reallocate. Give up two. Now you have 13 stickers. Your income has been reduced because you're paying the dentist. This is, a temporary. this is temporary, we hope. Have you made your reallocation decisions? No, no, not yet. Yeah. Okay. Now, I have a little caveat to throw in here that I forgot to tell you. If any of you decided that you could put your family of four into uh, housing level A, studio apartment, that's okay, but I want to tell you, you're illegal. And if you're, in the, if you're in that apartment, it's okay, but if you get caught, if the housing police come or someone reports you, um, you'll be asked to leave. 
you'll be told to leave. So just keep that in mind that you can put your, your housing st sticker in level A, but you're taking a chance. And this is, not, um, this is not made up. This is true. This is what happens. Okay, so would a couple people share what did they do? How did they reduce uh, and manage on 13 stickers instead of 15? Yes, Dixie. She went to two meals a day and took away the car. Who else? Yes. Ah. <laughs> That's a clever approach. <laughs> she, they gave up their spending money. They were at uh, spending money, saving $20. Um, a week, which is certainly very wise. We all think that we should be saving, right? And we, we do need to be paying our phone bill, but you're taking a chance and not paying, meaning you'll have to pay in the future or lose your phone. What's that? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> there are ways of trying to mitigate some of these things. One other person? Yes, Susan. No computer, no cell phone, and no black and white TV. The three things that many of us think we need to stay connected with the rest of the world. And you also reduced your health insurance to level B? Yes. Okay. Now, we hope that this family has some good fortune and that they can replenish their income. But, and again, this is fiction here. In the real world, this happens every day, many times a day, to many, many, many people in our community. And that is, they're back in 2008, uh, didn't tell you the year, and um, the life of the family is going to get even tougher. That is, the spouse that has the full-time job loses the job and doesn't even get severance pay. Remember, minimum wage doesn't have too many attractions, minimum wage jobs don't have many attractions. Um, and this person pro may have been first hired, first fired, we don't know. So they've lost uh, an important part of their income. That means you need to take four of your stickers away. So you're left now with nine stickers to cover your eight categories of basic needs. Only one category then will you have, will you be able to be in the middle at level B. Excuse me? You had, oh, you have a total number now of nine. You lost two, now you're losing four more. Now, folks, <clears throat> instead of asking what you've taken away, because I know that most of you are back down at the very basic level of basic needs, um, not a good place to be. 
for anyone, particularly children. Uh, let me ask instead, can a couple of you say how did you feel in this sort of fictional 12 or 15 minute exercise as you moved down the ladder, not having started too high to begin with? Discouraged. Discouraged. Yes. John went back to his childhood. Well, that's a good place to be, except you were poor. All you had was what? So you were on that very unpopular welfare program, aged to families of dependent children. Oh. <laughs> We manufactured its unpopularity now. Let me interject. It was low payment then. He's talking about the welfare program. There's our, now welfare is, is, is refer, the term welfare is used to refer to a lot of programs, but the, the welfare, the welfare program that he's referring to is still alive and well, covering about 15,000 people in our state who are extremely poor. And the maximum cash grant a family of three can get a month on that welfare program is um, $233 a month. They, yep, but not now. Not now. It probably pays a third of your rent. You get some food stamps, but food stamps aren't intended to keep a person healthy for more than six months. That's what the Department of Agriculture has said since 1963. And you can, may get, if you're 8% of the population of poor people, you may get some housing and you may get some Medicaid. Although, let me tell you, not all states are like that. But in South, here I'm digressing, so I better get going. I'll just tell you this one last thing about Medicaid. Uh, cause, and I visited, and some of you have visited in homes with families like this. Medicaid's a wonderful program and it is for people on welfare. But welfare only is two years at a time five years in a lifetime. It changed a few years back to be very limited. Um, children can get Medicaid in our state if they're under a certain income level, even if they're not on welfare. Um, but, and that's good. And over half of our kids are eligible, which tells you we have poor kids in the state. But the other part is meeting with the parents who are in low income jobs uh, most of them, not all of them, many of them, they don't have insurance. There's no insurance for them unless it's through their employer and you know low-wage jobs and even high-wage jobs don't necessarily provide health insurance now. And they are not eligible for any uh, government-sponsored Medicaid program unless they're disabled, but then they would be on a different program. Enough said, if you ever want to talk more about the problems of low-income people, come and see me. But one or two more comments just in terms of, John, you set me off there. <laughs> um, not your fault, though. Um, one or two more comments about how this, ex yes. It would, it would, we could, as, as I don't want to, all I could say is it, it depends on the state, but no, no state is generous. I was on public welfare myself and I was told I could not have a car. I didn't need a car. No, this was back in the 70s. And this was in the 60s. Yeah. Yes. 
Thank you, Michelle. Michelle. Yeah, one more. Yes, um, Andy. That's, that's, that's it, yes. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Um, the take home, maybe, from this, I hopefully is, my purpose has been, that um, we think more deeply about how fortunate and we are to have our privileged lives. We think about it with our lives with gratitude and with humility perhaps being more compassionate. Some of us are totally compassionate, but maybe some of us could be a bit more. Um, to think and be more generous and um, recognize we're part of an interdependent web. What the first song said, what affects one affects us all. We sing that. I think we mean that. And finally, to recognize whatever words you want to insert here. Um, there's a thin line between us and them. And so the title of our service today has been There But For The Blank, 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 Go I. You can say There But For My Great Brains, Go I. There But For My Great Family, Go I. Or some people say There But For The Grace Of God, Go I. You can fill in the blanks for that. Thank you for being a part of this this morning and doing this experiential exercise with me. Our closing...